we, we've talked about, about the tolerance to flow variation on the air side, but there's also the question of tolerance to flow variation on the fuel side. We can sort of think about it along similar lines or with a similar approach. Again, sort of modifying our 1D model to think about another set of constraints. Just to recap our uh, base case, So again, thinking about what's going to change, we have our cell, we're pumping a certain amount of current through that cell. That's actually staying fixed because that's dictated by the stack current. We're also keeping the cell size the same. What's now going to change though? So now the fuel flow, we're decreasing the fuel flow. And if I just write some conditions down, uh, 3.9 times 10 to the minus five. So here's gamma. Flow variation, 10%, approximately 20%. You have 3.5 times 10 to the minus five moles per second. So now the question is, as we, as we restrict the amount of fuel, something a little bit different is gonna happen now because we're keeping the airflow the constant. It's the fuel flow that's changing. So Xi dot, remember that's determined by current. Xi dot is not changing. This is fixed by the current. but we're restricting the fuel flow. End dot fuel is going down. So as the fuel flow goes down, the utilization is gonna go up. And so we can calculate that. It's just the reciprocal of the ratio of the fuel flows. And so for it, you know, 3.9 times 10 minus five, divide that by 4.3, uh, take the reciprocal, and that's gonna give us a utilization of 0.88. And then at 3.5 times 10 to the minus five, it's about 98% utilization. And then meanwhile, the air ratio, if I fix the airflow and we decrease the fuel flow, then the air to fuel ratio is going up and we can calculate that also as a ratio. So our air to fuel ratio in these different scenarios that I just outlined would be 40.4. And then at 3.5 times 10 to the minus five moles per second, we'd be in an air to fuel ratio of 45.0. And we can do the same thing as we did before with the spreadsheet where we set our objective function, but this time we're gonna let the outlet temperature vary, the cell voltage vary. So we're forcing the length to be 12.4 centimeters and we're forcing the utilization to be what it is according to these ratios that I just outlined. And if we do that, Kind of an interesting result. 10% flow variation, temperature goes up a little bit. Cell voltage hardly changes. And then at 3.5 times 10 to the minus five moles per second, 761. Cell voltage goes up a little bit. So not that dramatic really. It's like, oh, okay. It's pretty tolerant to fuel flow variation. Not a problem. But let's say we try 30%. So this is now less than 3.5 times 10 to the minus five moles per second. This is greater than 45, and our utilization goes over 100%. What does that even mean? Well, it means we're going to use up all the fuel. If I don't feed enough fuel to the cell, what's going to happen? I'm pumping all of this current through. It's forcing a reaction to happen. There has to be some Faradaic process to bear that current. And, and so what happens, as soon as I hit 100% utilization, the equilibrium potential it drops from whatever it is, one volt, 0.9 volts, 0.8 volts, and then it just plummets. Because we're using up all the fuel, all of a sudden the gas goes from being reducing to oxidizing. It's like a titration almost, where the indicator suddenly switches from clear to red. The, the simulation doesn't work because the cell goes into what's called voltage reversal. So it's not like the airflow. Airflow, yeah, it goes up, it goes down, the temperatures change. There's a certain tolerance level for that. It's not gonna, it's not gonna destroy anything unless it's really extreme. This is not the same thing. If you run a fuel cell in voltage reversal where you are actually creating uh, oxidizing conditions at the anode, you know, these materials are often stable under reducing environments, something like nickel. If I start oxidizing or pumping oxygen basically from the air side to the anode side, all those ions have to go somewhere. If they can't react with fuel, they're gonna react with the nickel 
catalyst. And we're going to go from nickel metal to nickel oxide. It causes it to crack apart. And then even if you put fuel back in and reduce it back to nickel, you've destroyed the morphology of the electrode. So within a few seconds of being exposed to oxidizing environments, the anode of the fuel cell is just going to be destroyed. So, so this, this condition that I'm outlining is, is quite different. It's saying that up to the point where I hit 100% utilization, I'm, I'm kind of okay. But if you go past that, boom, the sucker is dead. And this is true in, in PEMS as well. You do not want cells ever entering a condition of, of voltage reversal. Well, you have to have some fuel always on the fuel side. That means that the flow variation on the fuel side is actually much more critical. In a sense, it's a much easier problem fluid mechanically because um, the flow rate, remember, is 37 times less. The, so the flow rate on the fuel side is very tiny by compared to the air side. The conduits don't have to be as big because we, we can carry these fluids pretty easily, but we do have to be very careful about the flow variation on the fuel side.